Coming up on our newscast this hour, in the third cabinet meeting of the year, the government zeroes in on the need for more effective sanctions against North Korea and plans to boost domestic consumption with a national sales event ahead of the Lunar New Year's holiday. To stop internal strife, main opposition chairman Moon Jae-in declares he'll step down from his post, but not until strong leaders are picked to carry the party to the general election. 2015 was a slow year for China, recording its weakest annual growth in a quarter century. While policymakers scramble to come up with more stimulus measures, uncertainties linger. News Center begins now. Welcome to our Tuesday evening edition of News Center. I'm Daniel Che, filling in for Moon Young. We start at the presidential office of Chang Wade, where President Bach is calling for full scale diplomatic efforts towards stronger and more comprehensive UN sanctions on North Korea. Song Ji Sun has our top story. President Park Geun-hye maintained her firm stance against North Korea's fourth nuclear test conducted two weeks ago. At the third cabinet meeting of the year, the president directed government ministers to work closely with the South allies to come up with sanctions that will actually change the North. She also called for full military readiness against any North Korean provocation, both on the border and online, to guard against cyber attacks. Shifting to domestic politics, the president reiterated her call on the parliament to pass a slate of long pending economy related bills. She said this should be the year people feel the effects of the reforms outlined in her three-year economic innovation plan, and for that to happen, the related bills must be implemented as soon as possible. On Monday, the president had joined a public petition drive urging lawmakers to pass economy-related bills, and on Tuesday, she called on them to at least move forward with the labor reform package during next month's extraordinary session. Song ji Sun, Arirang News. Korea is gearing up to hold another nationwide sales event ahead of the Lunar New Year holiday. The Korea Grand Sale returns again starting January 25th through February 7th, offering shoppers special discounts and deals, some as big as 50% off local products. The government announced today some 2,500 businesses, including traditional markets across the country, will take part. Shoppers will also get the added benefit of up to two hours of free parking near traditional market sites. The country has hosted similar events including the K-Sale Day and Korea Black Friday to help local retailers tackle sluggish domestic consumption last year in the wake of the MERS outbreak. A hard-earned trilateral agreement between the labor, management and government now faces a risk of being scrapped as the Federation of Korean Trade Unions announced its withdrawal from the tripartite deal on Tuesday. The reason the government has been pushing labor reforms in a way that are not consulted with the labor community ever since the deal was signed back in September. However, the nation's labor minister, Igi Guan, explained later that the labor union has rejected further participation in the trilateral talks since December. He also urged the union to come back to the negotiating table and respect the grand social compromise. Last fall's groundbreaking deal was to make Korea's labor market more flexible by implementing measures like cutting down weekly working hours and introducing the wage peak system. Now, Korea's parliament remains in a paralyzed state as rival parties continue their standoff over a number of contentious labor reform and economy-related bills. 
President Bakune has devoted much of her New Year's speeches and meetings to put the pressure on lawmakers to take action and has gone as far as joining a petition campaign that calls for swift passage of the bills. This is President Bak speaking on Monday. We have our National Assembly correspondent Shin Semin joining us in the studio to help dissect the latest developments. Semin, let's start with uh, what prompted President Bak to jump on this uh, petition. Good evening, Daniel. Uh, it was just yesterday when President Park joined the public campaign after attending an economy policy briefing. She herself went to the campaigning site in Pangyo, Pangyo Gyeonggi-do province and put her own signature on the pe pe petition. It's not something that we see often, or rather uh, a rare move that came in connection with the National Assembly failing to pass the contentious bills. And it's not just the first action President Park has taken to urge Parliament to handle the contentious bills that are basically gathering dust. Earlier this year, President Park even pressured the National Assembly Cheng Yihua to uh, National Assembly Speaker Cheng to put his authority to use and push the bills to a floor vote. Cheng respectfully declined the president's call and said that maintaining harmony between the rival parties was more important. And with the ruling and opposition parties are at odds, it seems as though both sides have acknowledged that reforms need to be carried out. Listen to party leaders as they speak at a New Year press conference. Korea is currently in an economic and national security crisis. The only way we can overcome these difficulties is through reforms. Our biggest task is to eliminate inequality between large and small firms, regular and not regular workers, men and women, and class and income. Otherwise, our economy will not be able to grow. It's clear that both party leaders understand that the country needs to go through a reform, uh, but their approaches differ greatly. Right, it's not just about what you want, but how you do it and the way you approach it. And of course, we'll have a lot of conflicting levels of disagreement and, and uh, discontent between the two sides. That's part of their job, of course. And so far, the only victim here, the biggest victim is the bills that's, uh, that's been, as you mentioned, gathering dust at the National Assembly for almost a year now. So the latest development is that the ruling party brought the National Assembly Advancement Act under the spotlight, and that actually caused fuel the fire even further. As you said, in the midst of all this, the ruling Saenuri Party has pulled out a new uh, law out of their archives, which is called the National Assembly Advancement Act. Now, under it, the majority party uh, must... Uh, the majority party must secure minority support in passing the bills. Now, the ruling party wants to revise it so that the contentious bills uh, can be passed with just three-fifths support, while the assembly speaker is granted more authority to put a bill to a vote without bipartisan consent. Now, the ruling party believes the revision would resolve the current standoff in parliament over the key bills. But the main opposition, Minjo Party of Korea, is strongly against it because it surely gives a ruling party with its majority seats the ability to pass through. Well, it's somewhat understandable. You listen to both sides and, they, of course, they have their reasons and justifications for logging, locking horns and uh, being at loggerheads. But, of course, uh, slow and steady doesn't seem to be a very uh, important matter right now. Its uh, speed seems to be uh, one important element that's missing. And, of course, the people who are suffering are people who will be ultimately affected by the decisions that ultimately will be made by the lawmakers. That's right. The bills that we're talking about are starting from labor reform bills, anti-terrorism measure, terrorism measures, and some of them are related to improving the service sector, and not to mention in the redrawing the electoral map for April's general election, which is just less than three months away from now. Now, so the sense of urgency is higher than ever. Now, some of the bills improve working conditions for non-regular workers, young job seekers, and small and mid-sized businesses that are short of manpower. Now, a group of election candidates have also filed a lawsuit against the National Assembly itself as the lawmakers have failed to redraw the constituency map by the initial deadline that was set for the end of 2015. 
But already, as we saw through the New Year press conference made by the rival party leaders yesterday and today, it's most certain that their focus is different. And the Minjoo Party of Korea chair, chairman, Moon Jae-in, trying to deal with the factional strife within his party, which has left him and the main opposition to open blames and finger-pointing um, from the ruling party for straying from the dealing with the key uh, pending issues uh, related to the people's livelihoods. Well, with our backs turned against each other, it's hard to start a conversation. And of course, I hope someday soon the lawmakers will realize that we have uh, two ears and one mouth for a reason. They should listen more to each other. Well, thank you so much for your coverage today, Semin. My pleasure. A senior U.S. diplomat is in Seoul as the two allies look to coordinate their response to North Korea's fourth nuclear test. The provocation has severely raised tension in the region, but South Korea and the U.S. know they'll need China's cooperation to ensure Pyongyang is punished in any meaningful way. Our Connie Kim brings us this report. South Korea and the United States are still working on ways to persuade China that it's time North Korea be hit with the toughest sanctions yet in the wake of its recent nuclear test. U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Tony Blinken is in Seoul on a two-day visit for talks with South Korea's Foreign Minister Yoon Byung-se and Vice Foreign Minister Im Sung-nam. South Korea and the U.S. will focus on ways to cooperate in response to North Korea's nuclear test, including a U.N. Security Council resolution. Following his talks in Seoul, Blinken will travel to Beijing on Wednesday for talks with Chinese Vice Foreign Minister Chang Yesui. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry will also visit China next week to pressure Beijing to join the other members of the six-party nuclear talks in punishing Pyongyang for its latest provocation. China has emphasized the need for an appropriate level of U.N. measures, while South Korea, the U.S. and Japan are pushing for stronger and comprehensive sanctions. The meetings come on the heels of a series of talks between the six party members, as well as a meeting between South Korea's top nuclear envoy Hwang Jun Gook and his Russian counterpart Igor Morgolov in Moscow on Tuesday. Russia has been calling for all interested parties to refrain from taking actions that could raise tensions in Northeast Asia. South Korea will continue its efforts to bring out a strong and effective UN Security Council resolution on North Korea, as it's set to hold a series of meetings with members of the UN Security Council in New York through Wednesday. Connie Kim, Arirang News. China expanded at its slowest annual pace since 1990 last year, intensifying the pressure on policymakers to introduce more measures to boost the economy. With the growth figure widely matching expectations, markets here in Korea took the news calmly, but experts say there are still lingering uncertainties. Hwang Ji-hye brings us the details. China grew 6.9 percent in 2015, marking its weakest annual expansion in a quarter of a century. The slowdown comes as the world's second largest economy moves to a safer and more sustainable growth model focused on domestic consumption over government investment. The industrial sector saw growth of 27.42 trillion yuan, up 6 percent from the previous year. And the service sector saw growth of 34.17 trillion yuan, up 8.3 percent from the previous year. Chinese slowing growth figures, however, raised investors' hopes for a fresh round of stimulus measures, sending local shares up 3.2 percent. The latest data were also in line with what most economists have been expecting. Given that Korea's stock market remained relatively calm following the news from China, with the benchmark index edging up 0.6 percent on Tuesday. Still, experts are skeptical about whether the current trend will continue, especially in the face of plunging oil prices, which are expected to go lower after international sanctions on Iran were lifted over the weekend. Local shares will remain jittery, given the lingering worries about crude oil prices falling below the $20 mark. It was one of the worst beginnings to a year, not just for Korean shares, but global stocks extended their slide into a third week as oil prices slid to a fresh 12-year low. And when will we see the light after the seemingly endless tunnel 
Experts say it won't come until sometime during or even after the second quarter. Huang Jie, Arirang News. The International Monetary Fund has cut this year's growth outlook for the global economy to 3.4 percent. That's a 0.2 percentage point trim from an earlier forecast released in October. For 2017, the IMF expects the world economy to grow 3.6 percent, also down 0.2 percentage points from its previous projection. The cuts were attributed to China's slowdown and low commodities prices, which are dragging down growth in emerging economies, as well as strengthening U.S. dollar. An increasing number of mobile payment options are appearing on the market, but how widely are they being used in Korea, a country known for its high internet rates and early adoption of mobile technology? Uh, Kwon Jang-ho looks at the numbers. Instead of reaching for the wallet, more and more people are pulling out their phones when approaching the payment counter. A recent survey conducted by the Bank of Korea found that one in six adults are now using mobile payment services for both online and offline purchases. It's a relatively new trend that's come with the rise of smartphones and digital wallet services such as Samsung and Apple Pay. Over half of users said they had only started using mobile payment options within the last year. Among them, 44% said they use the service up to three times a month and 23% up to twice a week. Industry data shows that over five billion U.S. dollars worth of shopping was done on mobile phones with mobile payment services in the third quarter of 2015, up 58% from the previous year. Mobile banking is also widely used these days. There are over 60 million mobile banking accounts in Korea, and according to the central bank survey, nearly half of respondents use the services at least twice a week. But there are still many who've chosen not to make the digital leap. When asked why, they cited personal data leaks, mistrust of safety features, and mistaken transactions as their biggest concerns. A Bank of Korea official said more will need to be done to make internet banking more convenient and safe, so more consumers feel comfortable in adopting the services. Kwon jang Arirang News. Let's turn our focus to national defense. Less than two weeks after North Korea's latest nuke test, the South Korean army is in the thick of its regular winter training exercises. Yesterday, it conducted a river crossing exercise, a crucial operation on the peninsula during wartime. Kim Yeon bin takes us closer to the action. A fleet of K-2 Black Panther tanks cut through a blizzard, ready for action. In less than a minute, the tanks have made a river crossing, firing off rounds of ammunition and dropping smoke bombs along the way to deter the enemy. Soon afterward, several bridge erection boats appear, escorted by a fleet of Apache attack helicopters equipped with anti-tank missiles. Within just an hour, the unit has built a 200-meter-long bridge, and over 200 vehicles carrying troops and loaded down with supplies cross safely. This is all part of the Korean 20th Army Division's week-long winter river crossing exercise in Chungcheongbuk-do province, which got underway last Friday. Our division is Korea's best mechanized unit and we go through intensive training. We are ready to extinguish any enemy provocations. This is the first time the amphibious K-2 tanks have been part of the exercise. As the platoon leader, I am confident that no matter what the cause, we will come out on top of our enemies. The Korean Peninsula is covered with rivers both big and small. And given how many bridges could be destroyed in a time of war, the river crossing operation is crucial, providing the military with an important way of transporting troops and supplies. The drill runs through Saturday. Kim Hyun Bin, Arirang News. If you're watching us in Korea, you'll be well aware that we are experiencing some of the most severe winter weather so far this season. And what's worse is the Arctic temperatures look set to stick around for the next several days at least. Our Oh Soo Young braved the frigid cold to follow us this report. As we wade deeper into midwinter in Korea, we're feeling the kind of temperatures that chill you to the bone. In Seoul, the mercury started out at just minus 14 degrees Celsius on Tuesday morning, the coldest it's been this season. But with the biting wind, it felt more like minus 25 degrees Celsius for anyone out on the streets. It was the first time this season that a cold wave warning had been issued in Seoul. I'm wearing lots of layers, but I'm so cold. I think today is the coldest day ever. 
I've put on three layers of clothing, but it's still freezing cold. Much of Korea's central region is also under a cold wave watch. There's snow too in the southwestern part of the country and the mountainous parts of Jeju Island, where heavy snow advisories remain in place. The intense cold has already had grave consequences for area residents. Local health authorities say six people have died from illnesses caused by sub-freezing temperatures. And with the icy road conditions, there was a huge collision along Honam Expressway in Cholabukdo province. According to government authorities, 22 cars were involved in the accident on Tuesday afternoon, which left four people injured. The brutal winter conditions won't be getting much better for the foreseeable future. The mercury is forecast to stay well below zero through at least the middle of next week, when conditions should return to seasonal norms. So in the meantime, make sure you wrap up nice and warm in multiple layers and keep your eyes out for slippery patches on the street. Oh Soo-young, Arirang News. On Tuesday, Korea, China and Japan ended their trilateral two-day FDA talks. It is the ninth set of talks since 2012, but little to no progress has been made. This as they reached a consensus in a trilateral summit last year to speed up negotiations on the deal. What is hindering their agreement and what is the direction they should head for? Our news feature tonight with Lee ji -won. Korea, China and Japan held their ninth round of high-level FTA talks on Monday and Tuesday. The talks focused on issues such as guidelines for negotiations on product concessions and liberalization of investment and services. The three countries have had close economic ties since the 1990s, and in recent years the three combined surged as one of the world's major economic groups along with the likes of the EU and NAFTA. In 2014, Korea, China and Japan's combined GDP took about 22% of the world, and the number is expected to increase to about 29% by 2030, further elevating the importance of the Northeast Asian economies. The economic scale of the Korea-China-Japan FTA is massive. The combined GDP of the three countries comes to about 17 trillion U.S. dollars, a size similar to that of Trans-Pacific Partnership. Thus, the trilateral FTA will have a significant impact on the economy. A Korea-China-Japan FTA is clearly in the interest of each party. For Korea, most of the exports go to China and Japan, and from the agreement, Korea aims to secure its export markets. Going to uh, the FTA with Japan, Korean uh, manufacturers, uh, industries can get enter into the Japanese market relatively easier than before. And the, of course, we can have a chance to expand the technical cooperation with Japanese industries. And then owing to the FTA, Korean industries can enter into Chinese market, which is one of the largest market in the world, uh, with more efficient. Particularly in service sector, it will be another opportunity. In the case of Japan, the country had been maintaining a policy aimed at protecting its agricultural sector while opening up its strong point, the manufacturing sector. But with continued trade deficit and losing of competitiveness, Japan will seek to reform its trade policy through the trilateral agreement. As for China, it will aim at developing its technologies with the help of Korea and Japan while securing its partners for China-led economic negotiations such as the RCEP. Through economic ties such as FTA and Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, China seeks to go in response to the U.S.-led TPP and transatlantic trade and investment partnership and bring out similar effects to those. But even with the ninth round of talks, the three countries are yet to reach a final agreement. There are some difficulties in having progress uh, about the agricultural sector among three countries. Particularly, Japan has been very sensitive uh, to discuss about the uh, our agricultural sector uh, within the FTA framework. And Korea has been also quite sensitive. There are several other uh, industrial sectors uh, which each individual countries have put the first priorities. For example, in the traditional manufacturing sector and the service sector, as you know very well, Korea and Japan have comparative advantages over China. Moreover, the three countries have unresolved historical and political conflicts, hindering the economic partnership even more. 
One of the biggest obstacles affecting the three countries' diplomatic and economic partnerships has been territorial claims, such as Japan's sovereignty claims over Korea's Tokdo Island. Furthermore, there are still historical conflicts yet to be resolved. Both Korea and China were subjected to Japan's colonial rule and have been deeply scarred by the wartime atrocities before and during World War II. But the Japanese government continues to be unapologetic about its past wrongdoings by visiting the infamous Yasukuni War Shrine, which honors Class A war criminals, thus aggravating the situation. Diplomatic and historical conflicts make it difficult for the countries to see the economic matters as it is, and basic consensus on the issues must be established in order to persuade its people on the FTA deals. The difficult part will now start. Uh, once the framework issues, uh, framework meaning how to conduct the future negotiations for goods trade and for services trade and for investment. Once those framework issues are completed, then uh, three countries can focus on detailed negotiation on particular uh, sectors of trade uh, and particular provisions of the agreement. Now, discussions of detailed provisions will involve a lot of work, a lot of negotiation, and that part will be, uh, will be difficult. For Korea, China and Japan to grow as a center of Asia's economy, the three countries must work to solve their thorny issues first so that their FTA deal can be applied to its fullest. Lee Ji-won, Arirang News. Donald Trump is not only the talk of the town in the U.S., over in the U.K., British lawmakers spent three hours bashing U.S. Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump over his positions, including immigration and a ban on all Muslims from the U.S. Bruce Harrison joins me in the studio for more. Bruce, we could go on all day about Donald Trump. So many jokes, but uh, we will try to restrain ourselves. Uh, let's focus on the story at hand. Uh, they're talking about banning Trump from British shores. Is that a valid option? Uh, no, not really at this point. Uh, lawmakers hadn't actually really planned to ban Donald Trump, uh, especially because they don't have the power to do that. This was more of an airing of grievances, an opportunity for them to discuss Trump and his divisive policies, as you mentioned, uh, considering uh, that he's winning the race to become the Republicans' nominee. It's hard to say whether a ban which British Prime Minister David Cameron doesn't favor uh, would hurt Trump in upcoming par uh, Republican primaries. Uh, he's fed off criticism the entire campaign and heads into voting next month with an average 50 point lead across polls according to real clear politics it's unclear if the harsh words from the British lawmakers will hurt Trump's numbers Donald Trump is no more than a demagogue he panders to he panders to people's fears as opposed to their strengths turning as I must to uh, mr. Trump his comments regarding Muslims are wrong his policy to close borders uh, if he is elected pr as president, is bonkers. One of the MPs said this is what Trump does for attention, and many said a ban would play right into Trump's hands, boosting his presidential bid. Trump's threatened to cancel over one billion U.S. dollars of planned investments in golf courses in Scotland if he's banned. Well, uh, rem I remember he used to be a brilliant businessman uh, in his younger days. And, of course, he became larger than life, a little bit too much larger than life for this reality mm -hmm. programs. And, uh, yeah, he was just drifting further away from reality. Uh, speaking of reality, there's some uh, brutal, brutal news coming from other parts of our world involving deaths again, unfortunately. A man on a motorcycle blew himself up today just outside a police checkpoint in northwestern Pakistan. Ten people were killed, at least, according to reports, and more than 20 people were injured. Bruce, can you tell us more about the attack? Yeah, the attack in northwestern Pakistan today, uh, no one has claimed responsibility so far. Uh, officials said a suicide bomb rammed the bike into a checkpoint, a police checkpoint, that is, uh, stopped the bike and then detonated the bomb. According to officials, the blast killed at least five police officers and a journalist. The hospital also reported a child was killed. There is one child among the dead bodies. Among the injured admitted here are two children. 
Attacks have fallen since the government cracked down and the Taliban squeezed into small pockets of territory, but militant groups can and still launch hit-and-run suicide attacks on security forces. Last month, a man killed 23 people in the same part of the country when he blew himself up outside a government office. Thousands of women in Indonesia are putting on pink helmets and hopping on mobile app-hailed motorcycle taxis, said to be a safer form of transportation. The company is called LadyJack, and it's one of a growing number of services offering safer and more comfortable transportation for women in Jakarta. Last June, the rape of a woman in a public minivan sparked uproar in the city, leading to the rise of services exclusively for women. In other public transportation, such as public minivans, there are too many men in such a tight space, which makes me feel very uncomfortable. Lady Jack founder Brian Mulyadi said he formed the company because women need to be able to feel safe when they're getting around. Well, interesting uh, campaign or movements over there, but uh, Bruce, uh, people are still calling for more for the Indonesian government to do about the situation. Sure, Daniel. They have these services growing in popularity now, but um, according to one transportation analyst, uh, the government isn't dealing with the actual problems. Apparently, women have gone to police after being harassed in public transportation, and the police have seemed unsure about how to deal with that. Now, the same analyst said maybe a first step would be to install CCTV in public places that are deemed unsafe to begin uh, tackling the issue. Right. It seems like they were focusing on visually seeming more safer instead of focusing on more essential, uh, substantial moves like, as, as you mentioned, surveillance cameras and mm -hmm. uh, other uh, important elements that could actually help alleviate the problem somewhat. Well, thank you so much for your time again, Bruce. Thanks, Daniel. Without a doubt, the brutal cold conditions today had everyone in Korea talking about the weather, making it the hottest topic of the day. Let's go straight to our weather center for some updates with our Lee ji -hyun. ji -hyun. Hello, Daniel. Yes, what a day all day long. The negative readings, wind chill factor, and snowy conditions in some parts had us shivering. And here in Seoul, it felt as minus 20 degrees Celsius all day long. Minus 20 degrees Celsius, so uh, it probably feels like a very rewarding sensation if you actually work out and break a sweat in this weather. And it's no surprise that rivers froze across the nation as well. That's right. Now, the background picture behind me was taken from the Namhangang River today. It's all looking icy and frozen. And it seems like Namhangang as well as other main rivers should remain frozen for the time being as the cold blast will continue for a while, including tomorrow, with cold wave alerts remaining in place in most parts of the country, including here in the capital. So let's go right into tomorrow's temperature readings. Now, daily low here in Seoul will kick off at minus 14 degrees Celsius and minus 9 for Daegu. And even Busan will start out at minus 7 tomorrow morning. And daily highs will be a couple of notches higher than today, but still very cold. Only peaking at minus 5 here in Seoul, 0 for Daegu, but Busan and Jeju and Gwangju will see a positive readings tomorrow afternoon. Now, while the upper regions had a dry and sunny day, the Jeollado provinces and surrounding areas saw heavy snow, including Gwangju, where snow accumulated to 11 centimeters, and hundreds of incidents were reported on the roads in those areas today. And uh, unfortunately, more snow is still expected with up to 5 centimeters of snow in store and up to 10 centimeters over in mountainous regions in Jeju-do Island. Now, the current cold snap is likely to persist through the weekend and linger possibly into early next week, so be sure to stay bundled. Now, that's Korea for you, and here's a look at the weather conditions around the world.
We've come to the end of our newscast. As always, thank you for watching. Good night or good day, depending on where you're tuning in from.